Good morning to everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this fourth webinar on, uh, uh, during these second cycles of webinar health within the Feeding Knowledge Program. My name is Roberta Caglieris and I'm responsible for the priority number three, which is devoted to socioeconomic dynamics and global markets. Maybe some of you already know me because I presented the first uh, webinar which was held this past February on food price uh, volatility. The speaker today is uh, Professor Felicia Dinolfi, an international expert on economic issues on food price volatility. But uh, before giving the floor to uh, Professor Felicia Dinolfi, I would like to show you a short presentation about uh, the Feeding Knowledge Program. Feeding Knowledge Program was uh, uh, developed in the frame of 2015 Milan Universal uh, Exposition. Its uh, main idea is that the knowledge development is the best way to identify concrete solutions for food security that really meet the needs of countries. Its main objective is to create opportunities for dialogue and development through a Mediterranean network of experts focused on research, innovation and transfer of knowledge for food security. In order to reach this objective, we have identified five main priorities. The first is related with sustainable natural resources management. The second, quantitative and qualitative enhancement of crop products. Third is about socioeconomic dynamics and global market. The fourth is about sustainable development of small rural communities in marginal areas. And the fifth is uh, about Mediterranean food consumption partners, diet, environment, society, economy, and health. Uh, main results concern the creation of a neuro-Mediterranean scientific network on research and innovation for food security, creation of an international technology platform feeling, uh, called Feeling Knowledge, the creation of 12 focal points to support knowledge development at the local level, support to national extension services to transfer research results and listen to stakeholder needs, and last, support to policymakers for the elaboration of effective policies on research and innovation for food security. Our target area is focused on the Euro-Mediterranean region, uh, comprehensive of Albania, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Israel, Libya, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestinian National Authority, Tunisia and Turkey. But after 2015, project activities will progressively involve other regions of the world. Let's give a look to uh, the main activities which have been uh, um, implemented. Uh, at first, we uh, started with the organization of open webinars. There was uh, a first cycle composed of five webinars, which was held from December 2012 to March 2013, and attendees were uh, 183. The second cycle, composed of six webinars, started on March 2013, uh, and will last until May 2013, and it's ongoing. Our second activities concern drafting of five white papers and one policy document. White papers carry out an analysis on the state of the art of research for each priority and identify main research needs and formulate policy recommendations. Uh, Some time ago, uh, there was the launch of the international platform and the platform supports the exchange and development of research, knowledge, and ideas on food security. Uh, in this period, we are involved in the creation of a feeding knowledge network. So all of you who are participating to this webinar are welcome to uh, join us in the network. 
The network is uh, composed by researchers and experts focused on research, innovation, and transfer of knowledge for food security. How to get involved? You can use uh, um, our social networks, Facebook or Twitter, or uh, connect through uh, Google to feedingknowledge.net. Thank you for your attention and for sharing your ideas on food security. Uh, before giving the floor to Professor Felicia Dinolfi, I would like to show you a short video on the Feeding Knowledge Program. Today, food security is still a promise. Knowledge is the way to make it real. Feeding Knowledge will establish an international scientific network for research and innovation, supported by an international technology platform. The network will promote the transfer of knowledge on food security and support policies and programs that really meet the needs of developing countries. In order to build the basis of the Expo Milano 2015 legacy, Feeding Knowledge supports the recognition and dissemination of best sustainable development practices on food security. Feeding Knowledge International Network for Research and Innovation on Food Security. Uh, well, I am pleased to introduce uh, uh, Professor Felicia Dinolfi. Uh, his speech will be uh, entitled Food Rush, New Commercial Order, Agflation and New Concepts of Pro Poverty. Professor Felicia Dinolfi is Associate Professor at the Department of Veterinary Medical Science at University of Bologna. He graduated in Economics at University of Cassino and he got his PhD in Agricultural Economics and Policy in 2002 at University of Naples, Parthenope. Between 2010 and 2012, he was scientific expert at the European Parliament, Directorate General for Internal Policies, Structural and Cohesion Policies. Now the floor is yours, Felice. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, good afternoon to everybody uh, I think I can yes I can begin my uh, my speech on on the, on the topic that uh, uh, Roberta called uh, first of all uh, uh, if I okay I, I just problem with okay okay first of all I want to underline that the issue of access to food on a global basis known as food security has been making headway on the political and media agenda in the last years the alarm arise from the increase in food prices. This, is, uh, this was a novelty for a post-war society. In fact, from the end of the Second War, there was a long period of stagnating and declining prices on agricultural markets, with exception for a sport in the 1970s in concomitance with the oil shock that followed the petroleum embargo. Since the mid-90s, there has been an inverse trend, as we've seen, with sharp peaks in pharma commodity prices in 2007, 2008, and in 2010, 2011. According with FAO, World Bank, and other institutes, the most recent forecasts indicate a significantly rise in prices for the coming years. Behind the debate on the role played by the various factors involved, most academics agree that the long area of abundant food at low prices is over and has given way to an era of new scarcity. The phenomenon is usually linked to projection on demographic growth, according to which in 2050 there will be more than 9 billion inhabitants on the planet. Uh, too many to be fed, as recently argued by Lester Brown, the president of the World Watch Institute. For many, in fact, is the return of one of the recurrent nightmares of classical economics, 
the black point theorized by Thomas Malthus at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, in an era, of course, completely different from now. His theory is based on the principle of limited natural resources, question that, with the passing of the years, has lost importance since the contribution of technological progress has fortunately allowed us to increase agricultural yields at rates which would have been untintable at the time when Malthus built his theory. But what now is uh, revitalizing this theory and many Malthusian followers? Two answers, I think, are the main. First, the cited increase in world population. According to FAO, world population will be over 9 billion in 2050. This represents an increase of about one-third against the current population of 6.9 billion, numbers that come as no surprise. In fact, the population increase of over 30% predicted by the FAO for the next 40 years is well below the relative growth in the past four decades, during which the population more than doubled. The key contributor of global population increase in the years to come will be the planet's poorer areas and emerging countries, while the population in high-income economies will remain almost stable and in some areas, especially in some regions of Europe, there may even be population declines. The global effect of population increase in these areas will be strictly linked to migration intensity between country and town which will accompany economic growth and the rise in incomes. Of course, this has already been observed in the history of the development of so-called advanced economies. Around 50% of the world population is now distributed in urban settlements, the other half in rural areas. In 1950, only 20% of the population lived in large urban agglomeration. In 2015, this percentage will reach 70%. This migration is influencing also the agricultural surface available. And as we've seen in the, in, the, in the slide, the per capita farmed area decreased by over 50% between 1963 and now. But this scenario and this uh, uh, economic uh, development uh, accompanied by the, the migration phenomena are also contributing to orienting consumer choice for much of the world population towards products with larger contents of services and bring them closer to the food style in the planet rich areas. The most important contribution to the standardization of diets will be made by the expansion of the middle classes in emerging areas. Individual income in countries like India, Brazil and China rose at sustained rates in recent years only to slow down but not stop during uh, the current phase of world economic recession. To understand the effect that uh, this new wealth will produce on food demand, let me cite another economist, Ernest Engel. The, the relating economic law explained as what economists call the substitution effect. What's mean? In practice, with, within the basket of household food expenditure, some products are replaced with others considered of greater value and quality. As population gradually become richer in this area, in their diets, the unprocessed products like rice are replaced by products with a higher protein contents, such as meat, milk, and other dairy products. And by processed products with a greater value added, promoting, in this sense, a process of di dietary convergence. What we call the brick food break, where brick include Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And in these lines, we see some data that uh, uh, tell us how the world is changing. This trend will involve, in fact, several billion people in emerging countries, with multiplying effects also on the demand for some agricultural raw materials like soy and wet, which are at the basis of animal feed. Between uh, two and four kilos of grain are required to produce one kilo of chicken, while to produce a beef stick of the same weight, between seven and ten kilos of grain are required. Uh, relating to 
the issue of the increasing demand of raw materials, the FAO has long maintained the, that to meet the food demand of the increasing population, agricultural food production will have to increase by 70% from now to 2050. But as shown in a previous webinar done by Roberta Caglieris, the OECD and FAO recently estimate that for the coming years, the annual growth in production will continue to be slower than in the past, falling from an annual average of 2.4% for the previous decade to 1.7% for the coming years. According to this picture painted by the journalists of The Guardian, the agreement uh, that, we, that, we, that we read, uh, reported by The Guardian, that involve uh, the, a company from Bangalore and uh, uh, that, that, that uh, is the world leader in the production of roses and signed with the Ethiopian government, covered the rent of 300,000 hectares of land for around $200 a week to be given over the production of rice, palm oil, sugar cane and cereals for a period of 50 years. This is just one of the main, of the many agreements made in recent years by private companies, government, and sovereign wealth found around the world for the acquisition of land on a large scale. It represents a phenomenon that has accelerated since 2007-2008 price peak. The land rush is a direct manifestation of the uncertainty that dominates the global food supply system, and it has involved 80 million hectares in the last years. Investors are the richest country with raw material deficit, as well as country in which consumption and population grow at fast rate. Well, this is, well, this is uh, the global picture, the scenario, and now we have to go to impact. Okay. Sorry, just a moment, I have some problem with the slide. Uh, growth and volatility of farm commodity price are further compromising the already weak economic and political situation for many low-income countries. For the most part, these are net food importers, which are particularly affected by food price rises. Their impact in such context jeopardizes the equilibrium of the domestic balance of trade and leads to unsustainable increases in the cost of living. In the world more developed areas, the share of income allocated for food purchases is around 10%, of which less than 20% is used to pay for farm products. The remaining part goes to cover services that are added during the path from the field to the table. In less developed areas, the situation is radically different. Families invest much of their income in food purchases, almost all consisting of basic farm products. If volatility may have a marginal effect on consumption prices for richer countries, for poorer countries the, effect, the effects of price increases are significantly more impacting, with consequences such as the increase in poverty and the progressive slipping into the area of malnutrition for millions, millions of individuals and families. Yet, the effect of the rise in food prices are also felt in less poor countries, the emerging economies, where growth is often accompanied by widening of the schistor, separating well-being and poverty. In these countries, those who suffer are the still vast group of the less well-off. To indicate the contribution of farm price to general inflation, a new term has been coined, agflation, which stems from the combination of the terms agriculture and inflation. In this regard, the incidence of food consumption in the basket household expenditure in South Mediterranean countries is still account between 30 and 50 percent, and consequently food inflation often represents the most important component of the overall inflation. In this regard, a factor becomes more and more, cru and more crucial in measuring the multidimension of the concept of food security is the exposure to food import. 
the South Mediterranean region is one of the most food import dependent area in the world with net food imports accounting for 25-50% of national consumption, with the direct consequence of the rising in external food trade deficits. In particular, in those countries characterized for an high dependence of export earnings from oil, the exposure to food security risks is directly related with the oil price fluctuation. In particular, South Mediterranean countries are the largest net importer of cereal calories in the world, importing about 56% of the cereal calories they consume, which represent a, sig a significant part of the South Mediterranean country diet, reaching, in the case of Tunisia, about 50% of the total consumed calories. The exposure of the Southwest Mediterranean countries to world food price volatility is then first linked to their high dependence on the external market. This situation shall produce, in case of price shock, dramatic consequences in terms of food inflation. About a 30% increase in food, in food price, for instance, in Egypt will result in a 12 percentage point increase in poverty and a 14% increase in food price in Morocco would result in a 4% point increase in poverty. This, is, this data was elaborated by the World Bank in 2011. Furthermore, the tight of supply available on food commodity market for certain strategic products like cereals increase the risk of disruption in procurement and shortfalls in food availability in countries with high food dependency ratio. This means that vulnerability to food price shock is basically influenced by import dependence, but also by the fiscal position of the considered country. High import dependence associated with a sound fiscal position is not of concern. On this field, it's interesting the result came out from a study conducted by the International Food Policy Institute in 2012 pointing out how poverty and income inequality in the Southwest Mediterranean context are, like, are likely higher than official numbers have long suggested. In this study, a new indicator of food security risk is developed, margin, merging a micro-level and micro-level measure of food insecurity. The first one is defined as the share of food imports divided by total export plus net remittance inflow while the prevalence of child undernutrition is used for representing the micro-level measure of food insecurity. The result is a classification of Southwest Mediterranean countries into five risk groups, as we seen on the right of the slide, based on this composite indicator. This approach goes behind the traditional micro-aspects put at the basis, at the basis of ordering index, for instance, the Global Hunger Index. In conclusion, two points are emerging in this situation in order to best fit measures against poverty in Southwest Mediterranean countries. Country. First, it is critical that policymakers base their decision on realistic baseline, because decisions based on flawed data can lead to significant financial losses and damage to economies and people. Data can more realistically be assessed. Government of Southwest Mediterranean countries use many policy instruments in order to mitigate the effect on consumer rising from fluctuation in global agricultural commodity price. Those measures have helped Mediterranean countries in isolating households from price volatility and food inflation. In particular, the latter speaks in international price has consequently complicated the macroeconomic scenario leading towards an extensive use of resources devoted to private subside and other instruments, including production subsidies, import protection cuts, and build-up for food reserves, taking away fiscal resources that can be used to finance growth enhancing investment. Of course, in, the, in this direction, fiscal and inflationary pressure has grown. Some Mediterranean countries with high food import dependence and large fiscal deficit 
such as Libya, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Algeria, and Tunisia, appears most vulnerable to a sustained food price shock. Some scholars, and in particular, I, I want to cite uh, Albert and Peters, uh, uh, that in 2011, analyzing the fiscal implication of increased expenditure on subsidies, argued that the impact on public finance of the commodity price increase has been large by comparison with other. For Egypt, Algeria, and Tunisia, food subsidies as a percentage of GDP increasing during 2007-2008 food price peak. The weight of the combination of food and fuel subsidies on total government expenditure increased dramatically in Egypt, where they reach 30.9% of current government expenditure in 2008, but also in Morocco and Tunisia, where they reach about 20% in 2008. Subsidies have several disadvantages. First, they divert significant resources from alternative and perhaps more productive uses. Second, when they are not targeted, they are expensive because most benefits are captured by the non-poor entered in-kind food distribution systems, entail heavy administrative overhead and substantial wastes due to storage losses, and they encourage corruption, waste, and the leakage of food to non-human users. Fuel and food subsidies are often higher than spending on social protection programs and health, and these subsidies are often inefficient and ineffective. An easy way to gain political consensus in the short term, but a bad way to, bu to build the future of sustainability of the region. I finished my speech. Thank you for all, and of course, uh, questions and suggestions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Felicia Rinolfi, for your very interesting speech. Now I will uh, um, show you a very uh, short presentation about uh, the priority number three, also to leave some time to our participants to go on formulating some questions to Professor Adinolfi. Well. As I told you, uh, I'm responsible for priority three, uh, which is entitled as socio-economic dynamics and global market. The staff is uh, uh, composed of uh, uh, people working at the Mediterranean uh, Agronomic Institute of Bari. And we have Roberto Capone, who is the principal administrator, head of Department of Sustainable Agriculture, Food and Rural Development, and me, uh, my name is Roberta Caglieris, and I'm a researcher and consultant in the Department of Organic Agriculture in the Institute. Uh, then uh, our experts are from the University of Bologna, in the person of Felicia Dinolfi, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Veterinary Medical Science. Then Fabian Capitano, Capitano, sorry, who is Associate Professor in Agricultural Economics and Policy at the University of Naples, Federico II. And Fabio Gaetano Santeramo, who is Research Fellow in Agricultural Economics, Department of Agricultural Economics and Policy of the University of Naples, Federico II. Staff from Medit at the uh, Polytechnic Institute of Milan is uh, uh, comprised of four members. Uh, there is Valeria Baudo, Gianfranco Elia, Paola Corti and Francesca Concia. My technical staff is composed of Laura Civetti and Marinella Giannelli. In order to uh, organize and manage our activities, we use the SAMI collaboration tools, among which Dropbox, emails, and Skype conferences. But let's uh, give uh, a look to uh, the white paper. Uh, uh, we entitled it as the uh, priority, and so uh, socio-economic dynamics and global market. 
uh, we put in evidence two main key uh, messages. The first is about food volatility. Uh, in fact, we strengthen the, uh, the role of uh, the structural characteristics of food market with respect to food uh, volatility and also food security issues in South Mediterranean countries, which are very relevant since uh, these countries are the largest net importers of cereal calories in the world. Then the second message is related to the agricultural policy in South East Mediterranean countries. Uh, they are uh, relevant uh, in order to improve uh, adequate infrastructures and efficient market challenge to support the value chain efficiency and the risk management tools to strengthen credit, transport and storage capability and last to enhance marketing and producers organizations. We started with an introductory section entitled The Background, A New Era in the Global Agricultural Commodity Market. In this section, we uh, identified and analyzed the main causes driving the increase of agricultural commodity prices. And so we mentioned uh, population and the income. Then uh, we dealt with diet, biofuels, land, water and extreme uh, climatic events, technology and research, farm site and market dimensions. But we also uh, took into consideration some factors which uh, became very relevant uh, with respect to food price volatility that are stocks, spe speculation and restrictions of trade. Uh, then, in the following, uh, there is uh, a chapter uh, devoted to, uh, some, uh, uh, to present some indicators used to measure food security in South Mediterranean countries. We started from uh, World Bank's $1.25 uh, day poverty line to measure progress toward the first millennium development goal. Then we uh, considered the IFRI Global Hunger Index. Uh, then uh, uh, we uh, dealt with uh, the uh, exposure to food import, which is relevant with respect to uh, our uh, issue. And uh, uh, we related to Bricinger countries uh, classification. Then the Global Food Security Index developed by uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit. But uh, what are the objectives of uh, our white paper? First, uh, our uh, ambition is to develop a multidimensional approach in measuring food security so that we created a model uh, considering some uh, indicators for measuring food insecurity in the Southeast Mediterranean region. Then we also went to analyze the country-specific performance in managing the domestic effects of international food price volatility. At the end, we uh, produced some policy outcomes uh, which were uh, thought to uh, give uh, um, some recommendation for uh, a global solution of uh, the uh, problem of uh, food volatility. And there were other uh, considerations related to uh, the specific situation of the countries we uh, took into consideration. Uh, in order to get involved uh, in our, uh, with us and, also, and so to participate also to uh, the integration of our white paper, you can join us to uh, our uh, website. Uh, or uh, you can also use uh, the social network, Facebook and Twitter. And pay attention that after join the platform, you will be shown five main priorities. So uh, if you are interested in the third priority, uh, the one about socioeconomic dynamics and global market, you are welcome to join us uh, and also contribute in the network that we are uh, creating uh, just in this time. 
So thank you very much. And uh, now uh, I'll uh, give the floor back to uh, Professor Felicia Dinolfi for the question time. Felicia, the floor yes. is yours. Yes, okay. I, I, I don't know if you see me because I have a problem with sharing my screen, but I think yes. Okay, the first question is, uh, what might be the action that the international community can take to address the issue of, uh, of food security? Uh, uh, this question is, uh, is, is, a, is a very good question. I think that uh, the responsibilities of politics in this respect are great. In a recent article published by, in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics, two leading scholars argue that in 2008, the trade policy initiatives aimed at reducing the impacts of price increases were in fact a major stimulus to the increase that immediately followed, uh, in particular the adoption by many states of measures to restrict or prohibit export and the reaction implemented by net importing countries that uh, uh, try to stimulate and facilitate import account for, 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 uh, for the scholars cited for 45% of the price increase for rice, for, uh, for instance, and about 30% for uh, the rice, the increase uh, in, in, in the price of, uh, of cereal. Uh, I think that the, 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 the first challenge now is to rethink uh, the rules and the role of international trade policies. This is the first step. The first step that uh, uh, was uh, su suggested, uh, suggested also by a document released by the G20, uh, and that uh, push uh, all the international community to try a solution to challenge uh, uh, a problem that was new for the modern society. Uh, and I think that rethink the, the, the international uh, agreement in this regard is one of the main, of the main priority. Of course, we need also in, at global level uh, we need more transparency, more efficiency, uh, also to help the in state, countries, area to build in building system of crisis management market. Uh, and uh, how we underlined in the presentation, for example, the lack of uh, reliable data on production, demand, stocks, and volumes. Uh, uh, is uh, an important question to, 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 to address. And I think also that uh, we are to develop working hypotheses on uh, reservoirs, uh, biofuels, and a more inclusive and coordinate strategy to help uh, for the poor. Uh, for, for example, in the case of reserve, the idea to constitute a, a virtual global reserve strategy is one on the idea that is in the floor uh, and I think that is an idea on which it's possible to work also uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of, uh, in, in a regional context, for example, the Mediterranean context. I think that rethinking the WTO more transparency and efficiency in, in the data available, and uh, a global strategy on the reserve, biofuel, and action uh, for the poor, I think, are the, the, the three main priority that the, the, the international community have to address in the, in, in the short term. Uh, the second question. The second question is uh, uh, how might research contribute to the increase of agricultural productivity. But we cite the data about uh, the, 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 the trend in productivity in agriculture. Uh, but I think that uh, according with, uh, to many analysts, uh, some data indicate that the, that, uh, the end of, uh, of the season of the Green Revolution is, uh, is, uh, is not close, is not closer. Uh, I want, to, I want to underline that I believe that the Green Revolution is anything, is anything but over. Some recently produced data from a study commissioned by the UK government, in particular the study is, is entitled 
the future of food and farming, uh, uh, if I remember well, show that in reality there is uh, still important space uh, uh, that may be exploited to further extend the benefits of technological progress made until now. Second, I think that one of main reason of, uh, of the decline in agricultural productivity growth rate is net decline in public expenditure devoted to research and development in the farm sector, which has stagnated in, uh, in poorer countries, while in more developed countries it is growing at uh, uh, lower rates than in previous decades. And of course there is a big difference between public and private research uh, in the light of the of the of the public goods that the first address and uh, and the the the, the, the short return that the second uh, try to to to, to give. Uh, third question: Are there more economic indicator to measure uh, food security? Uh, yes, there are uh, different economic indicators to, to measure uh, food security. Uh, I cite the, the, the one, one of these is the economic indicator uh, developed by, by, by International Food Policy Institute. At the same time, we have the Global Hunger Index uh, that uh, use the proportion of under uh, of uh, undernourished and the underweight children, the rate of children under the age of five that are that are undernourished. But uh, beyond this, there are there are many many indicators. For example, the the, the economy is the intelligence U, uh, unit uh, from the economists uh, develop a global food security index that include, for example, uh, three three questions. Uh, availability, quantity and safety of food, and, affor and affor affordability of, uh, of food. Uh, I think that there is also space for develop a uh, new set of indicators uh, in order to include uh, in the concept of poverty uh, many other variables that are becoming uh, more important than in the past in the assessment of the poverty of, of a population. Uh, other question, uh, for example, food security and its relation with food safety. Of course, there is a relation uh, in, with, between uh, uh, food security and food safety. And how I, I said, for example, the, the, the Global Food Security Index developed by the economist taking into account also the aspect of food safety, uh, because of course it's a part, is a relevant part of the concept of food security. Other questions, there are many questions. Uh, uh, actually all agree about the crisis and value of the three FS, farming fuels and food. What are the factors that are driving the price increase of food commodities in developing countries? And the food insecurity is due to production or distribution. But uh, in this regard, I think that the, 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 the increase in food price is a global phenomenon. Of course, the, the, the role of the uh, transmission price mechanism is different from country to country and uh, depend and, uh, for, from uh, many factors. For example, there are factors that uh, have an impact on the boat. Uh, food security uh, 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 and an increasing price. For example, the logistic factor. Many, ma many concerns in the South Mediterranean country are linked to the question of the logistic, to the question to the, we to the waste in logistic, to the question of how logistic is efficient. And of course, uh, food insecurity is a problem uh, both uh, of both production and uh, distribution. The, the, the relevance of the, of the boat is depending uh, by the, the, the specific condition of, uh, of the country uh, we are analyzing. Another question. Many scholars argue that subsides are largely inefficient and uh, unsustainable, especially in Arab countries, and that it is important to move towards more targeted direct support to the poor. Uh, 
and creating safety nets. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think what I I already said. I think that uh, uh, um, the 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 weight of the 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 subsidies and the typology of the subsidies is uh, depending of the of the specific condition of the country. Of course, we said about fiscal balance. This is uh, uh, the main aspect on which uh, a country can organize its subsidy system. Uh, of course, uh, there is the need to better balance the subsidy system. There is the need to use uh, uh, more data, more realistic data. There is the need to uh, uh, well target the subsidies. Uh, I'm not, in principle, I guess, against the, the, the food subsidies, but I think that uh, to organize and well fit and, be, and, to, uh, and, to, and to best fit the, 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 the organization of the subsidies, we have to take into account the specific condition of the country and, first of all, the fiscal balance of the country. Uh, the last, no, no, not, not the last, between food security and sovereignty in Europe Union, what are your suggestions on the policy to be followed to reach this challenge? But I think that uh, these challenges are strictly linked, of course, and I think that we have to take into account the specific natural constraint that uh, uh, characterize uh, uh, different area in the world. And of course, the natural constraints that uh, characterize most part of the Mediterranean region are very, are very, are very strong uh, uh, and, and very hard to, 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 to cross over. Uh, uh, of course, I think that one of the solution in the long term, one a part of the solution in the, lo in the long term uh, would be uh, the in, in increasing domestic production will be improve efficiency of the internal system distribution will be improve the logistics uh, aspect in will be improved we will be improved the the um, the management of the reserve and will be to organize uh, if possible, uh, uh, a strategic management reserve, not not at country level, but uh, uh, almost at uh, at regional level. The last question, that is two question, is uh, uh, is food price volatility and uh, high food prices the most reason for having reopened the international debate on food security? And I would like to know how it is it is possible to find a time series on food share expenditure, especially for the North African countries. Uh, I think that food price volatility is, uh, is, uh, is a good reason for uh, having the reopening of the international debate on food security. Also because the, 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 the topic of food security uh, um, include now uh, new, new, new aspects, uh, and I think that the the work start with the G20, uh, followed by the last G8. I think this work is a, a good basis, but it's not enough be, because uh, we need that uh, this uh, this work, this uh, work that fix some principle uh, in which uh, the the a global food policy uh, co coordination. Can find the the the, 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 the a, a good floor in which in which uh, uh, implement uh, some global measures. I think that this document, this uh, work, uh, needs to be followed by concrete action. And uh, what we see is uh, that uh, there are not concrete action, but on the contrary. We are uh, exper experiencing a uh, new action uh, direct to ban export, to limit export, and to export inflation for, from a country to another. Last aspects uh, regards the possibility to find a time series on food share consumption. Yes, there is the possibility, and uh, for example, is uh, is enough to. Uh, to see the work done in the last two years by the International Food Policy Institute, and uh, we can see that the new data bank 
managed by the institute uh, contain uh, data for a great part of the North African countries that are uh, able in, in respect the, the the theme of the food, the food share expenditure, and I think also that uh, uh, a lot of work uh, done by the, the World Bank uh, contains some uh, data that uh, use a time series from the post-war to now. I think that I have uh, answered, I hope, well to all questions. Thank you, Professor Felicia Dinolfi, for your very exhaustive uh, reply. Now I will introduce you to next webinar. So next webinar will be held on May 29 from uh, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the uh, to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's uh, entitled Water Scarcity, Climate Change and Challenges for Food Security in the Mediterranean. The speaker will be Professor Luis Santos Pereira from the Instituto Superior de Agronomia, Universitade Tecnica de Lisboa. Thank you to all of you who have gathered at this webinar and see you soon. <laughs>